Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you are all doing well. You are welcome to tonight's live webcast, direct to you from Sweden. Tonight we've prepared a special nostalgic time travel back in time. But before we get to that, I would like to mention the nice images that we were watching before we started. They were submitted to us by Takashi Maeda in Japan, and they're the lighting design of a new sports facility. We thank Mr. Maeda for submitting them to us as part of the Showcase Reward Program. If you're interested about learning more about the Showcase Reward Program and how to earn a free upgrade to Capture 2020, then you can read more about it on our website. Simply follow the Showcase link in the top right corner. I would also like to mention our latest reseller edition, Hong Fang from uh, Guangzhou in China, uh, who were recently added to our long list of resellers. If you're interested about learning more about them or how to contact them, you can find the details on our resellers listing on our website. So before we get to the main feature of the evening, I would also like to remind you that you are encouraged to write questions and thoughts in the comments field below here throughout the webcast. If you have any questions related to, to the topic of tonight, I will try and cover them as we talk about them. Um, but we will also have an open Q&A session at the end of the webcast. So if you have any general questions or um, questions not related to the historic theme of tonight, then I will save them for, for the open Q&A session at the end. So um, we're going to travel back in time more than 20 years to a um, lost time. Um, we're going to go back to 1995. This was um, some 20 I can't do math. Many years ago, more than 20 years ago. Um, this was when the idea of capture was born as uh, out of an idea of how to make lighting plots without pen and paper. Back then, computers looked quite a lot different. They were usually white, uh, very large and very heavy, or at least the screens were. And they had just started running Windows 95, which was the new operating system from Microsoft that made programming life much easier. So Windows 95 was the first operating system on, on Windows, well, the first Windows operating system that we had a capture software for. We had actually begun experimenting on the Amiga before this, but never reached anything you could call a product. So, fortunately, Microsoft are really good at backward compatibility, so we can actually run Windows 95 software on Windows 10. So I've prepared my laptop here for you tonight, even given it the old school greenish background color that came with Windows 95 so that we will all feel at home if we are of sufficient age. And we're going to dive straight into Capture 1.0. This was released in 1995. However, back then, computer screens were smaller than today. Uh, I think most had a 1400 by 700 or maybe an 800 by 600 pixels large screen. So screen space real estate was very different from what we are used to today. So here we are looking at Capture 1.0 released in 1998. It, uh, if you purchased it, you received it on a floppy disk. This disk fits 1.44 megabytes, which was enough for Capture back then. It's not, no longer quite the case, but we were quite happy about it back then. So Capture 1.0, as you can see, comes in a view split into four. You had one top view, one front view, one right view, and one perspective view. In order to navigate in the views, you used the key arrows on the keyboard. And as you can see, 
all of the views are kind of flashing as you navigate because it's redrawing everything in, by today's standard, a very primitive way. In order to zoom, you would use the plus and minus keys on the numeric keypad. And you could click on fixtures to select them, but you couldn't actually click on objects to select them. So at the center of every fixture was a small orange dot, which you needed to hit with the tip of the mouse in order to select it. And then you could move it using the mouse. Now, if you look carefully in the 3D view here, you may be able to see the footprints of some beams here. Um, we could turn these on and off for the other views as well. And there was a, an extra button which was called light with smoke, which added the beams in wireframe to the visualization. Now the word visualization of course means to make something visual, um, which is a broad scale from nothing to what fully visual. And in this case, you needed to combine what was on the screen with your imagination because, yeah, um, not perfectly visual, I suppose. <coughs> now, in Capture 1.0, we had no DMX connectivity or anything like that. So in order to turn fixtures on and off, we had a concept of spot groups. Fixtures were called spots at this point. So there were spots and spot groups. So we had this list of spot groups where you could double click on the groups to turn them on or off. There was also one button to turn all of them off so that you could isolate groups. So if I were to select one of the fixtures here with the filter in question, I think it's a wash light here on the side. I can move the fixture out and there's a separate arrow, which is the focus point of the fixture, which if I moved that would focus the fixture. So you can see it looked very different back then um, and it took more time to operate than it would in Capture today. Now, in addition to the spot groups, there was also the spot editor, which has a list of all the spots in the project and allows you to change properties like the field angle, um, the wattage, uh, the brightness, and a few, but not very many properties. Now, the reason we have a brightness setting is because you could actually select a portion of the perspective view and hit a render button which did a ray tracing of the region you had selected. Of course, this took a lot longer than 10 seconds back then. Um, what we're looking at here would have been science fiction back in 98. Um, so you had the crude wireframe view and these renders available to you. In addition to this, there was also the bars editor where you could add and remove pipes. Pipes had a start point and an end point, and you had to type in the 3D coordinates by hand. You could actually load and save the bars configuration if you want uh, to take the bars separately in and out between show files or project files, as we call them. Um, I would also like to show you the spot illustrations. So the fixtures, this may be very difficult to see because it's so tiny in today's resolution, but each fixture illustration was a pixelated bitmap image that you could edit by adding and removing dots in the image in this editor as if it were MS Paint in a sense. Um, to round things off about Capture 1.0, because I basically showed you everything there was, um, there was also the ability to print a plot, which was one of the main reasons we started with this. And there was a very simple report functionality as well, uh, where you could export and print basic reports of the fixtures in your design. So this was Capture 1.0 in 1998, um, a 
at this stage, Capture was a hobby project. Um, development continued and moved on to 1999, where Capture 2.0 was released. So what happened or the major step forward in Cap from Capture 1.0 to 2.0 was DMX. So in 1.0, we could manually turn on and off lights, but in 2.0, we were actually able to dim individual channels and receive DMX. One of the ways we could receive DMX was using the artistic license DMX dongle 2 had a 25 pin serial port connection in one end and one DMX universe input on the other end. Using that, you would get channel levels into capture. And if you look closely, ah, and actually here we got mouse uh, navigation in the views as well. So I can use the middle mouse button to rotate the view, but I still need to use the plus and minus to zoom in. Uh, so if you watch carefully on one of the beam footprints here, you can see that I can turn it on and off by dragging the DMX level one up and down. Now, if you were connected with a very specific network protocol uh, that was actually only used for test purposes, you could even get it over the network into capture, but we weren't quite at a networking level yet. And another reason for getting DMX values in was that we had actually added a fixture library, if you may, uh, where a number of fixtures were hard coded into the software. Um, so what you could do was you could, uh, let's see, Yes, so under lighting, there was an option called fixture types where you could add and remove fixture types. A fixture type had um, a field angle range or a spread limit, as we called it. You could define the wattage and the weight, and that was it. Now, using these fixture types, uh, <coughs> when adding fixtures into the design, you would choose between them. But in addition to that, there were also a few moving lights available. So with Capture 2.0, there were around 10 moving lights available. They were the Clay Packy, Stage, Color and Zoom, High End, Studio, Color and Spot, Martin, Max, and the PAL 1200, uh, the VL5. So to show you how that worked, I thought I would actually add one so let's remove the three profiles we had here let's insert a new one and choose the mac 500 and put it on dmx channel one let's change the illustration as well to the moving head now if we go into this channel view that was new in 2.0 and i use I have the Mac 500 DMX protocol printed uh, on a paper here. Uh, channel one had the shutter, channel two had the dimmer. Uh, we had pan on 11 and tilt on 13. So if we turn on the beams here as well, you can actually see now in wireframe, mind you, that we had pan and tilt visualization in Capture 2.0 in 1999. I believe we also had iris would be channel nine, yes, but no color or gobo wheel. So it was quite simplistic at this point, but it did the trick. Uh, this was of course quite exciting and we wanted to do, to do more with DMX, so the next improvement came in Capture 2.1, which was released later in 1999. Um, this added a, a number of connectivity options, including the AVAB serial protocol. So over the serial COM port of a computer, which doesn't exist today normally, 
we were able to receive DMX. And one of the reasons we wanted to do this was an arts project in Gothenburg for the millennial shift. Uh, this was called the Hourglass. It was uh, a number, I believe, 10 or 12 modified searchlights, um, military aircraft searchlights of around 10K each, I believe, that had been um, motorized and were, was controlled by a lighting console. Uh, the idea was to project a countdown on the clouds for the millennial shift. Um, so obviously it needed some pre-programming. If the clouds were there, you couldn't do it in reality. So you needed it virtually. And capture was used uh, for this in Gothenburg. Um, in addition to that, um, we had also added ArtNet support, version 1.4. Uh, we had a few other options as well. We had SandNet support, something called Win Commander, which to be perfectly honest, I don't even remember what that was. There was also a text interface apparently, which I also have no idea anymore what, the, what on earth that did. And finally, you could also add objects. So we had added a number of parameterized objects, uh, for instance, a box. So you could now enter the dimensions of an object you wanted to add. So I didn't show you this bit, but in order to draw objects, you actually had to do it triangle by triangle, and it was quite tedious. So here for the first time, we made it easy to add a box or what more did we have? A cylinder, a floor, and you will, I mean, you will re recognize these objects from the library today, the black box and the proscenium. These were all here in Capture 2.1 back in 99, which is both good and a little bit scary if you think about it. So this was in 99 um, and the project was doing well and we continue developing Capture and over the next three years, we did a complete rewrite of the software, which meant all of the source code was deleted and we started from scratch. The result of this was Capture 3.0, which was released in 2002. Now, as you can see, it's beginning to look a little bit different. Uh, the toolbar has a number of buttons in it. And if I create a new project, or actually let's open a project, you can see that the bottom right window is now what we today would call the project window. And we only have three design views left. Now the difference would be that these views could actually be configured and modified so we could change what type of view these are. And one of the reasons the project window ended up in the bottom right corner is that previously the spots editor, the bars editor, and all of the editors, they appeared on top of the other windows. So with the limited screen space available, they were quite annoying. So bringing all the information down into the bottom right corner was a way of better making use of the screen space available. So here we have the properties tab, which has the properties of the project file. We have the fixtures list, which we still have today. Here though, we have a control pane that we looks different today than it did back here. Um, so what happened was that we could select fixtures and use this control pane here to control its various parameters. You can see how the design was inspired by um, wheels on lighting consoles. We had the universe list, just as we do today. Layers was a tab. Uh, so was layer sets, which was called simply called sets at the point. You had the ability to create different plots. And there was a report generator that was actually quite brilliant, and we are bringing it back in Capture 2020. Um, 
What was unique about it was its ability for you to add columns on the fly and it would generate the report based on the columns you had chosen and group the information accordingly. So it was actually extremely flexible, albeit a little bit confusing because there were no templates to, to start with, so you always started from scratch. Now, the elephant in the room, the visualization. Uh, obviously, we went from wireframe to what I guess you could call solid beams. So we started using OpenGL 1.1. And at this point, you needed to have the right graphics card in order to be able to run OpenGL. This was not a feature that would be available out of the box on any graphics card. So you had to have specific hardware for this. Uh, but as you can see, it was a major step forward from the wireframe visualization that we had before. Um, it didn't quite have real shadows. So if you look closely here at um, what it looks like around the drummer, uh, the lighting is kind of just smearing all over and there is no clear definition. Um, so in a sense, it was all still quite rough, but looked ages better than the wireframe. Finally, I would also show you what was called the providers. So these were basically uh, networking DLLs that enabled Capture to speak different console languages. And we were quite connected back in 2002. We had ArcNet, uh, AVAB, IPX. Uh, we had our own DMX boxes that we sold that were USB based. We had CITP. Uh, the Compulite VC protocol, uh, we supported EQ, Antec boxes, HOG2 PC, Hydra IPX, uh, the Dutch Landbox or Belgian, Dutch or Belgian Landbox, and finally Sandnet. So there was a wide range of connectivity options avail available. And we introduced the concept of the library where you could drag and drop items from the library into your design. So if we dragged a box into the design, we could inspect its properties in the design, sorry, properties tab, which today is called the design tab. So you can see there's a great deal of similarities now between Capture 3.0 and what, what we have today. Now, Capture 3.0 was maybe the first release that we actually sold to a reasonable amount of cap, uh, customers. Uh, so this really spurred us on to keep Capture going and develop it even further. The next version of Capture that we released again, three years later, uh, was Capture 2005. And this coincided with the Eurovision Song Contest in uh, Ukraine, in Kiev, uh, where a team of Swedish uh, LDs and console operators uh, designed the, the lighting. It was led by Bulan, in, seen here in yellow in the bottom right corner. Uh, they were all using the ETC Congo lighting console to pre-program uh, the show's songs using Capture 2005, which we also got to show in our very first booth at Plaza in London. This was actually in 2006, I think, but you can see the 2005 logo up there. Here I am standing next to Vangelis on what, the right side of the picture and Andy Hook on the left side of the picture. Andy was our UK reseller with Shock Solutions. He works with White Light today. So let's take a look at Capture 2005. Now Capture 2005 was again a rewrite. So we have only ever done two full rewrites. That was for Capture 3.0 and for Capture 2005. There's actually source code for Capture 2005 around today in Capture 2019, although not a lot, but some small bits and pieces are still around from 2005. So what was new in 2005? What was exciting back then? Well, 
The rendering, of course, got better. So let's switch to the live view and let's select. We have a bunch of par cans here at the back of the rig. So what was new in this release was shadows. So if we take this actor and move him back and we turn on effects light, you can now see that we have Ah, oh, darn, I'm confusing myself. I'm sorry. No, no shadows yet in 2005. That was too fast of me. Um, but what we can see is the navigator taking shape. So the red selection region around the selected objects, the green buttons in the lower right corner uh, that we all call the navigator, this was all introduced in 2005. Uh, and made it a lot easier to select and move objects around in real time. <coughs> um, yes. So a few other things that were introduced in 2005, apart from this tree view here and the design tab, um, which was also new, we added the uh, scenes. which are the same scenes as we have today. So the ability to move scenery around to different locations. We also added the ability to import DWG files. This was then done using the extract function, uh, which had the DWG option in it. And finally, the rather unique capture feature of saving presentation files. This was introduced in 2005. Now, with 2005, we started selling a fair amount of, of licenses. It really felt like we had a product going, so we were quite eager to continue. So three years later, we released Capture Polar. Capture Polar was our major breakthrough. Uh, and with Capture Polar, we got the real shadows that I thought we had for 2005. So if we switch to the live view here and turn on a fixture, I just have to, <laughs> so this is funny. So Capture Polar from 2008 is trying to connect because I have the HOG3 connectivity drivers installed on my laptop and they are still working with uh, Capture Polar. So let's clear those universe connections. Now we should be able to turn the fixture on. So as you can see, the control pane, as we knew it for a number of versions, appeared in Capture Polar in 2008. And the ability to right click to focus the lights where we click. So now if I select the actor and say effects light, you will see the shadow of the actor on the floor. So this was new in Capture Polar, the use of OpenGL 2.0 with real-time shadows and HDR. And HDR is the nice effect you get when you combine beams in the air without completely oversaturating the screen. So in previous versions, the moment two beams overlap, it the intersection was insanely bright and after three or four beams it was impossible to see anything basically. With HDR it's, it's, it's much more realistic and, and can handle combinations of beams in the air. Um, there is I believe still a few visualizers in lighting consoles today that don't have HDR so if you mix beams in the air it, it oversaturates um, and you don't you don't get something you can look at very easily. And the second major thing with Capture Polar was that we introduced the Mac version. So I'm not going to be showing you the Mac version here today, but this came in late 2008. So any project file that you drew, you could transfer it back and forth between Mac and Windows. And this was unique and I believe is still pretty unique for any complete design package. Uh, it is unique for any complete design package. 
Um, so that was, of course, a very big step forward for us. And uh, we have a relatively equal distribution of Mac and Windows users today. So clearly it was, it was a good and solid choice at that point. Now, Capture Polar had a pretty long run. It was on the market for some six years. Um, and we kept adding functionality to it throughout the six years. It didn't have all the features in the beginning. So Capture Polar users got more and more features uh, with time. This turned out to be possibly a bit of a pedagogical mistake because some users came to believe that you would get free updates with Capture. Uh, this wasn't actually the case. It's, it's simply that it took many years before we charged for an upgrade again. So the next time we did charge for an upgrade was in 2014. Um, when we released Capture Argo. Now Capture Argo came with a very long list of features and improvements. The performance improvements were great. Um, we added SketchUp import. We added the snapshots that we know today. So the ability to light the number of fixtures. Um, let's go to live mode. Open the control pane, break the console link. <coughs> Excuse me. So the ability to record these still snapshots. Um, and have them be part of presentation files you exported. Uh, the ability to, to render the view or uh, we call it save image in Capture. It's, this option down here where Capture actually renders at a higher quality than you would have in the live visualization, as well as the ability to render movie snapshots into video files. This was all new in Capture Argo. And of course, in the Mac version as well. Following Capture Argo, we've done more or less one release every year, and I'm just very briefly going to show you a few of them. Um, in 2016, we released Capture Atlas. This was our first 64-bit release. So for the first time, Capture required a 64-bit operating system. They had actually been around for quite some time, but there were few incentives for software uh, manufacturers to make 64-bit versions of their software, unless it used a lot of memory. But what we saw with Capture users is that they imported more and more complex scenery to the point where Capture actually used the three gigabytes of memory and 64 bits made sense. So with Atlas in 2016, we went 64 bits. So we lost quick time for video playback. So the video players that we had in the media tab now use Windows Media Foundation or AV Foundation on the Mac. Um, and we did a number of improvements to the rendering engine where we introduced physical based rendering. So if I go to live mode here and select some fixtures, um, Studio Beams. Um, it's probably not going to come through very good on the screen here, but the, the physical based material model where you can define the smoothness, metalness and properties like this, they were introduced in, in Capture Atlas. Um, we also added the omnidirectional fixtures so in the library, under lighting fixtures, generic. So the library was in a tree, tree view here. And as that grew larger, pushed us to change the library browser in the later version, as, as I'm sure you know. Um, conventionals, omnidirectional. Let's bring up the intensity a bit. 
to 60,000 lumen. So here we have our portable sun. So the omnidirectional light that lights in 360 degrees with shadows um, was also a new feature in, in Capture Atlas in, in 2016. And the following year after that, we released Capture Nexum. Did I click? Did I not click? I did click. Um, where, as you can see, the user interface has stabilized, I suppose you could say. Um, we have the tree view here that disappeared in 2018, um, but the rest of the content is as usual. So some things we added in Capture Nexum was the ACES color rendering technology, uh, streaming video using NDI and Cinema 4D import. So, did we have any questions here? Nothing specific to the old versions. So I hope you've enjoyed seeing these old capture versions as much as I have. Um, obviously they range back for quite a lot of years. Um, we've talked loosely about perhaps making one or two of them available to the public for you to play with. Although, yeah, they are of limited use these days. So, uh, I can see I have a couple of general questions and obviously I have all versions ever of Capture running on this computer, so I have good opportunities of answering your questions. So if you have any general Capture questions, feel free to write them and I will try to cover them. We have one from Matthias Hallén. He is asking, if we have an object imported from a 3D program in the shape of an S, is there a possibility to speed fixtures along this shape? I guess he means spreading the fixtures along the shape of the S. Um, unfortunately not. This would have to be done manually by placing the lights one and one. Um, what you could possibly exploit the snapping of capture, but then you would have to have segments of the S as individual objects. So I'm afraid I don't think we have any fully satisfactory answer to that question. Anthony Lee is asking whether Capture 2019 is pixel mapping friendly. So a general challenge with pixel mapping is related both to the performance of the software and what you're trying to achieve. So Sometimes you just want to produce a good looking image and sometimes you want to simulate some specific technology. So there are a few different ways of pixel mapping in Capture. So from that perspective, I would say it is friendly. Um, there's a number of techniques you can use. One of them is using the LED fixtures in the library. So if you search for pixel, for instance, you will find that under generic, there's a number of RGB pixels. Now these are the individual pixels. So if you have some very custom shapes or custom design, you can go for the DMX controlled RGB pixel. You could also use, I believe if I search for tape, we have a few generic lead tape-ish objects that are strips of LED that you can piece together. These are still DMX controlled. But we also have uh, you can use the panels to your advantage as well. And these would be controlled using video. So here a basic choice is whether you're running it by DMX or by an actual video file. So using video, you can map it as a material to a panel. And finally, the third option is using the uh, pixel generators of, sorry, texture generators of materials. Now these again are DMX controlled, but a kind of hybrid between pixels and materials. We have a separate tutorial on this. Um, we will provide a link to that after the webcast in down below here. Uh, so we can show you in more detail how to use these techniques. 
Um, I guess the only unfriendly in a sense thing here is that you need to find and choose the technique that is right for you at a given time. So next question from Intrasonic, where is the Amiga? Unfortunately, I sold off all my Amigas. My partner Lasse does have one or two um, at the island where he lives. Uh, we will, I guess, at some point try and get it up and running and running some old Amiga version of Capture. It was even more primitive than the PC version I showed you. It was 2D only. Uh, and there are some emulators around today as well. But as I said, everything was on disk, diskettes or floppy disks. So we might not even have any of the original stuff left, to be honest. Oliver Obernauer is asking, why on earth did we introduce the replace mode? The drag and drop exchange for fixtures was one of my favorite features. Yes. So in Capture 2019, we changed the way the fixture replacement works. So if you had fixtures in the design, let's throw in something. A few Fresnels from Celicon. In previous Capture versions, in order to replace a fixture, all you needed to do was drag another fixture on top of the fixture and drop it. This was good in many ways, but what happened was that we added more and more kinds of replace. So you could start replacing imported objects with fixtures. So if you imported a DWG with blocks for the fixtures, you could replace them. Uh, then we introduced the omnidirectional fixtures which also support replacing and we added support for replacing um, objects with trusses. So if you import a drawing with trusses from DWG you can now replace them with capture trusses and so on. It simply got to the point where when you were dragging something from the library into the design different things would happen depending on exactly where the mouse ended up and it got incredibly messy. So we were at the point where we had to choose either not to make it possible to replace some things or to have a separate replace mode. Uh, and at that point we went for the separate replace mode um, because it is, it is more clear and also it, it is actually, it's visible in the user interface that there is a replace mode because we did get a lot of customer support from people asking how to replace something because it was so hidden before. So sometimes in order to take two steps forward, you have to take one step backwards in some departments. So we did lose the ultra fast replace capability. Yusef Handel is asking, any updates regarding sending back pan and tilt information to Onyx. Unfortunately, I do not have any information. Um, I've, we have, I have, I have reached out to, uh, to the Onyx guys recently, but have not received um, any kind of date stylish information I could pass on to you. Um, but I trust they are working on it at top speed and we will have it any day soon. Alex Pelacani is saying a lot of things. Good evening to begin with. Good evening. Uh, he's wondering whether in the future we will have the possibility to lock selection from an object. Uh, so what we have today already in that sense is that if you have a layer that is locked, so let's create a locked layer and we lock it by checking the locked column. Let's now take these three fixtures and place it in the locked layer. Now in the locked layer, I can't move them uh, by accident, but I can still select them. However, there is an option in Capture, a global setting that renders all locked layers unselectable. This means that I cannot click to select these objects anymore. 
So in part it is already available. Uh, we do have plans in the future to remove that global setting and rather have a separate option for the layer which is called unselectable. Um, this way you, you could have some locked layers selectable and some locked layers unselectable and it would be easier to find at that. Uh, Anthony Lee is asking, how would I link Resolume to the video wall? Where is the menu? Uh, so the best way to link Resolume with Capture is using NDI. So if you are using a new enough version of Resolume, then it, it can output the video using NDI. NDI is network based, which means the video would appear automatically in the media tab. And then you can assign it to the material using the texture media property. I don't have it set up here so I can show you, but um, it should be quite straightforward. Uh, you may need to turn on NDI as a setting in Resolume. Frankly, I'm a bit unfamiliar with it, but I know many users use it. So maybe you could reach out on the cap, uh, unofficial Capture user group on Facebook, which is called Capture Design and Visualization. Uh, where I'm sure some Resolume savvy users could guide you through the process with ease. So, I believe this concludes our session of historic capture versions and general questions. We are going to take a little bit of a summer break now and be back in uh, a couple of months with new topics and new discussions. I have one bonus questions that got in the last minute, uh, which is related to using MANET again as in older versions, um, where the short answer is, is basically no. Any, any kind of changes to MANET connectivity is completely up to MA. Uh, at the moment, things are what they are, and we are not aware of any changes in the near future except that with MA3, other visualizers will be, uh, we will all be on an even playing field in terms of connectivity with the MA3. This is all we've been promised. So thank you everyone for watching and uh, catch you again after July when we'll be back. Uh, have a great summer. Enjoy the festivals or the beaches or whatever you're up to. And thank you for watching. <laughs>